ปักปั๊บปั๊บปั๊บปั๊บกระตุยWell, so far, having a good time. We got a woo. It's a good time. So this gentleman here is just gonna make sure that the future versions of ourselves are also um, happening. Uh, all right. Okay. So uh, don't forget we've got the live link here again. It's bit.ly/sg17live for your uh, colleagues uh, online and all of our hashtags, including the Godoy one. Where's Will? Yeah, he's probably still asleep from last night. Okay, so one of the things that the uh, the board works really hard to provide for all of you, uh, as well as our volunteers, is is a plethora of blog posts that uh, are really useful. So, for example, Scott wrote one briefly on debriefing and intro to medical simulation facilitation. So we probably come up with about at least one, if not two, a week from the board uh, that are kind of usually directed towards healthcare simulation technology or operations. So definitely useful, really useful content. Um, that's free for everyone just to go to the website. The uh, subscription is, is less than a cup of coffee a month, uh, a, cup, a Starbucks cup of coffee. Uh, so uh, it's just about $60 annually or, or $50 per person if you sign up three or more from your institution. Um, and there's a lot deeper resources beyond this, but definitely uh, want to check out the blog on simghost.org because we uh, work really hard to be able to try to help you guys throughout the year uh, and uh, as well as internationally. So a couple of notes about things that we noticed logistically today. There was some confusion. The handouts that we provided to you with your individual courses, those are the session numbers. So, you know, session block A has courses one through five. B, we're currently now, I think we're going into C, if I'm not mistaken, after the uh, next uh, uh, keynote. So at C1 through 5, D1 through 5. But the rooms are actually, Andrews 1 and 2 is just here. 3 and 4, 5 are combined right now, and they're just the around the, the corner next to the pocket nurse um, table. And uh, then 6 and 7 individually are across from that. And then atrium 4 is actually inside the Sim Center, so you go past where the, the drinks and the coffee are into the Sim Center. You open up that door, you'll go past the reception desk there on the right, and it'll be their first right down that hall towards that classroom there. 
So a uh, few other little notes. For those of you who parked, um, they're going to ask that uh, for, t for tomorrow and on Friday that you park in P3, which is just a little bit further down, the, down the, that road there um, into the hospital. Um, and uh, you just take your, your parking and they'll val uh, validate it here, so you don't have to worry about that. But we definitely, uh, apparently some of the P4 is more for, for some of the patients, so we want to try to move it to P3, please. Thank you. Um, bus tomorrow morning, um, there was a slight issue with the hotel handout. Uh, it's definitely still the same time, about 7.15 to 7.30 is when those buses are going to be leaving, last one around 7.30, so please do uh, be there for that because, again, we started at 8 a.m., but bus the, on the Friday morning, just so that everyone's aware, because the vendor hall closes on Thursday, uh, Friday morning, we'll be just taking the bus at 7.45 because the courses start right at 8. There'll still be some... Um, uh, the same similar type of uh, breakfast uh, dishes or catering that we had with the uh, the small um, pastries and, and coffee, but still at 7:45. So just take note. Uh, Wakeman is providing more tours, so those are 9:15 uh, and 9:45, and 10 to 10:30 tomorrow, and Friday 9:30 to 10, and 10:15 to 10:30. And then for tonight, one more time, Sim Alliance is Good Night's Comedy, so. Uh, food and drinks, we're leaving here at 5.30. Um, uh, the the uh, food and drink starts at 6, that ends in, uh, at around 7, so really that's why if you want to participate in that, it's best to come with us. And then the show starts at around 7.30, 7.45, I think, or maybe 8, and then uh, we're done by 9.30. That's right, we're done by 9.30, and we're on the buses back to the hotel. Uh, it's a comedy club. I, I went to check it out six months ago. The Comedians obviously rotate through, so they didn't know who uh, we would be getting tonight at that time. Um, and obviously, it's uh, I have, we have no control over what the comedians say. So, uh, if you're easily offended, then probably you might want to think about I don't know. I mean, it might be nothing, it might be something. So uh, if you're not coming or you want to drop off your bags first, because there were a bunch of folks that said, ah, we brought laptops, we'd like to just drop them off. So the first bus that we have going is going to please be reserved for those folks that are not going to go to the comedy show or they want to just quickly drop off that bag. So that first bus is going to go to the hotel first, wait there just 10 minutes, because we have to keep it the schedule, and then meet the other buses at the comedy club so the first bus is for those that want to drop off something quickly at the hotel or are not coming to the event okay so uh we'd like to bring up our friends from pocket nurse here and uh, as well as erica and jennifer if you guys are here i hope you are <laughs> is jennifer here she might be out in the hall yeah Yes, so it's, it's going to wait 10 minutes and then it's going to continue on to the comedy club. So anyone who wants to go and just quickly drop off some things, uh, backpacks or whatever, um, can do that. And then we will, uh, it will continue on, right? Okay, uh, we're just getting pocket nurse right now. So pocket nurse, um, you know, uh, along with Beeline Medical, were two, the two founding sponsors of Simgos. So before we even had kind of... Uh, too much of a plan of action, you know, in terms of just a plan of action is all we had about what we were trying to create with Simgos as, a, as, a, as an organization. They each gave about $3,000 to the organization to just get it started. This was back in 2011. So we, you know, we always continue to recognize Pocket Nurse and, and Beeline Medical as being our founding sponsors. And, uh, you know, for several years in a row now, Pocket Nurse, um, Anthony Battaglia and, and his team um, have uh, donated two $1,500 scholarships to enable two individuals um, to be able to come to the event um, from um, schools that are, or programs that are nonprofit and can demonstrate a, a, a sincere need for the support. So we have a, a committee look at those and review them and then um, make the call. And so this year we had Erica, who's worked as a simulation technician at the University of Texas Arlington, and uh, Jennifer Daxton, who's an instructor at Upstate EMS Council since 2010. And both of these individuals uh, were uh, supported by their managers with letters of recommendation 
organization, um, demonstrating that they had a sincere passion for kind of growing and developing and expanding a simulation program, and um, then, uh, but that there was just such a financial hardship for those programs to be able to send individuals that uh, we recognize them in that sense. So Jennifer uh, Thaxton, is that you? Come on up. Hey, you're the next contestant. <laughs> So uh, if our pocket nurse friends are out here, do we have the camera standing by? Is the photo camera somewhere around here? Oh, take it on the, on the cell? Okay, great. Cool. So uh, pocket nurse friends, come up here, and we'll, um, we're going to just take a photo to recognize all that. Thank you. So we sincerely appreciate Pocket Nurse for that support because it really enables our community to continue to grow. Okay, and with that being said, uh, we're uh, really excited uh, for the support from Laredal, uh, who've been huge supporters of, of the organization internationally, not just in North America, continually uh, acting as either gold or platinum sponsors for all the m major events that we've had all around the world. And so we're really thankful for their continued support um, and uh, to be able to help put on our keynote today from the Sim Center director here at WakeMed, Dr. Amar Patel. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Yeah. We're going to give me one second to just get switched over. So uh, I did want to start off with something in, on your tables. Uh, so we're going to have a long conversation about virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality. And I'm really excited because it really flows well with the world of simulation and the next steps that we all will take as we approach the endeavors of simulation methodology and technology. There's some really cool stuff out there today. And it goes really well with Laerdal's mission to helping save lives. For us to be. Uh, informative and creative and innovative and take our hunches and ideas and our thoughts to the next level, we really have to think about the future and where the future is taking us. And we have to think about these multi-spatial planes where we're mixing different things together to, to, to take it to that next step. So one of the things I will talk about a little bit later is PTSD and the use of virtual reality to help somebody who is going through PTSD to overcome the challenges of PTSD. So we've got a great video that will focus a little bit about that, and I want to share, with, share that with you as well. Also with me today, and you'll see Don sitting over here on the left-hand side, he is wearing a Meta 2. It's a beta um, mixed reality headset. Um, and the really neat thing with that is we're going to actually have a chance to see that in action. You guys are some of the few folks to see it. It's not something shared. It's not something out there. Don's company is working on stuff with it, and he, it's been nice to have him here to share that with you, because I want you to see the impact this has in healthcare. It has in helping people get better at taking care of people, at helping saving lives, and it's important for us to have that, that approach. So one other thing I want to show with you is something that we're doing, and on each of your desks, there's a card that sits there, and this is something called Living Pictures. If you have a chance to see it, if you've downloaded the app, fantastic. Uh, if you haven't, I want to share with you really quickly what it does. So one of the neat features with something called Living Pictures is your ability to take this postcard and turn it into real life. Right. So you can actually use it for scenarios. And so what we have done in here is the start of a scenario. Your pre-brief, your information for your scenario is nothing but the picture. But when you use an app, it comes to life. And let me share with you what that looks like. Everybody see my phone? Let's see if I can make this work this way. Then. I think we're going to look at this weird, huh? There we go. Maybe a little slow. We'll have to turn our heads a little bit. 
But the idea is to post any type of video, any type of scenario information into a postcard. And you standardize your pre-brief and your information. And then at the end of this particular video, it says your scenario starts now. So think about the possibilities as we get into virtual and augmented reality. Think about the ability to standardize information and disseminate it. Think about the ability to be able to have a standardized approach at scenario delivery and scenario information. It changes the entire concept of how we do simulation in healthcare. So I love the idea of looking at, at different virtual environments, right? And so I'm a big fan of how mixed reality plays an integral role in our healthcare simulation. So this is a cave. Anybody familiar with a cave? So those that are familiar with caves, what is it? It's a holodeck. How long have we been talking about holodecks? Anybody watch Star Trek? Right? OK. So some of you guys. Holodecks are environments that are completely clean. They allow you to create anything you want to create in that spatial environment. So I can't go around lighting an OR on fire. I think I'd get in trouble a couple times. Right? But what I can do is recreate an OR fire in a virtual environment. What I can do is have individuals train in that virtual environment, work through the processes, work through the issues, using the simulation methodology and the educational principles and the technology as a means of delivery. Right? I can't create an OR. Unless you want to invest in the OR, I can't create that OR space. There's something unique about it. But what I can give you is not only the visual imagery, but the smells, the moisture, and everything else that makes that simulation experience very much real. Caves are awesome places, right? And you feel immersed in that environment as you work through it. The cool thing with a cave environment is if you jumped off of a cliff virtually in a cave, you will feel like you're falling even though you're not moving. It's a really cool place to be. So to the point where Crayola actually has created their own cave. Yes, the crayon company has created a cave. But why? Why would they create a cave environment where the lighting is consistent and the environment changes. Say it. For autism. For autism. For autism. There's so many medical <coughs> applications in virtual reality to change it that it's an amazing place to be able to see. Where the future takes us is this ability to have a heads up display. Where it takes us is the environment where we're able to actually take care of providing education and get all of the information right in front of us. We're able to work into the clinical setting and see the impact that um, uh, we are having to our patients by digitally seeing their information on a screen. We are headed there. Lots of people are working on this process. The challenge is we're tasked with the educational delivery at the end of it once it's created. And so how do we do that? How do we accomplish that? So what do you see here? I'm going to feel really old if somebody doesn't tell me what movie this is from. Matrix, Matrix right? Letters and numbers. When we take it one step further, what do you see? A rabbit. Does everybody see that? You see the duck? Now do you see the rabbit? Perception changes based on our environment and our reality. And if I can really customize the reality and the environment to what we need to provide adequate education, then we're effective at the delivery of education. So we know this to be matrix, right? And I'll take it one step further, and I want to play a short matrix portion of why CGI is such an important thing. Oh, maybe.
Can that actually happen? Once, right? But it's realistic, right? Matrix was one of those movies that came out and we all went, whoa. What was the biggest premises behind Matrix for those that have seen it? You lived in what? You lived in an augmented reality. You were part of a completely different world, completely able to interact with it. And really, it was more of a mixed reality than an augmented reality. Because what you felt and, and were part of, were able to touch, see. And if you died in the virtual world, you died in real life. Right? So it took us to that next level to think about what is possible when we always think about things that are impossible to accomplish. So computer-generated imagery is something that's been around for a really long time. It's, it involves special effects and using computer software. And it's images that are generated um, to, to give you that perception of something different, right? It's on top of a lot of different stuff. And so has anybody ever watched, um, uh, I think it's Alien, the movie Alien, right? A lot of that is driven by virtual, that virtual environment or that computer-generated uh, environments. So there's a huge need for, for CGI. We see it a lot in simulation technology. We see it a lot in the educational programs. We see it a lot in healthcare and medicine. Right? Why do we see it in healthcare? Where is it utilized in healthcare? What one application do we see a lot of CGI? CT. Right? What about ultrasound imagery? There's a lot of different places where CGI is absolutely utilized and an important part of what we do and how we accomplish that. So it's used in films, in programs, in commercial programs, in print media, in medical imaging. This is a great example of where CGI plays a valuable role and how we're tasked at the end of it. What movie? Jurassic Park. I'm going to play one snippet of it, and we're going to talk about it. I want you to think about why Jurassic Park broke all of the CGI rules. What did CGI allow us to do in 1993? It was the first time in history. It allowed us to see dinosaurs in their natural form in a natural habitat. It was the first time that happened in our history. It, CGI really changed as a result of what this movie brought to the table. It allowed us to see dinosaurs. Right? Before that, what was it? Pictures and thoughts and ideas. But this really animated it for us to see the interaction it has in a, in a movie format, right? So it really changed the whole principles of CGI. Any ideas? Avatar. Avatar, right? Why was Avatar so unique? It created an entire virtual world that became a mixed reality. And it did it in a way where the amount of money they spent on this movie was nowhere near what they spent on Jurassic Park. Right? They were able to, 95% of this movie was virtual, was done in CGI. Right? So today, the possibilities are completely endless when we think about the use of computer generated imagery. <laughs> virtual reality. Virtual reality uses the computer technology to create a simulated environment. So it's not, it's not like your traditional user interfaces. VR places the user inside of a given experience, right? We often get lost in those experiences. Um, how many of us have iPhones or Android phones, right? So I often relate to this as Pavlov's theory. When you hear it ding, what do we do? We check it, right? We naturally want to pick it up and look at what it is. The unique thing with virtual reality was it did the same thing for individuals. When they saw that virtual world, what do they want to do? They wanted more of it, and they wanted to explore more of it, and they wanted to understand more of it. They became immersed and part of it. We're seeing full educational curriculums today utilizing virtual worlds to deliver educational content. How many of us know what Second Life is? Right? 
So Second Life is a virtual world in which you can interact. Ironically enough, people have created virtual hospitals in a virtual world and charge bitcoins to get taken care of at the virtual hospital in a virtual world. You can do education in a virtual world. People actually deliver full educational content in a meeting space in Second Life because that's how today people are seeing the environment in the world. So when we think about the need, there's a need for four virtual environments. And we think about Doom and Second Life and Sim. World of Warcraft is probably one of my favorite games. Who's familiar with it? So yeah, one World of Warcraft fan. Developed in 2004, today has grossed $10 billion, has over 100 million users. The amount of time people spend in World of Warcraft, they would have been able to solve the issues with cancer four times over. It's a virtual environment that has that Pavlov ding. People want more of it. People want to explore it more. Our goal in education, our goal in simulation is to give them that same level of fidelity. It's to give them that taste, that understanding that they want more of it. You have been successful in simulation. If they walk into your simulation experience, they solve that patient's problems, they learn something and go, this was awesome. I want to come back. You've done well as a result of that. Right? So I had to put this up there. Uh, the, need for percept, uh, the need for a perceptual simulation and the ability to see information differently. And designers are really good about helping you focus in that way. Uh, short circuit? Yeah. Any, yeah. So how did he see the world? What did he see himself as? A human. He saw himself interacting with the environment as being alive. And that's what virtual reality helps us do. So believe it or not, virtual worlds are created, are utilized across the country in different things. Human resource folks use virtual worlds. Why do HR folks use games like Second Life? I see you as an individual in this space. You can create whatever avatar you want. So how do you perceive yourself to be? And do you interview differently in a virtual world than in person? So you're seeing the process of people asking you to create an avatar of yourself, interviewing you in the virtual world, and then applying that in the real life application. Architects and designers use it. The coolest thing with some of the virtual concepts is that you're designing a new sim center. You've hired an architect. You get ported into this virtual world and are able to walk around your virtual sim center without the building ever being built. You're able to see where the monitors are, where the technology is, how it's being hooked up and managed. And then you port yourself out and can make changes to the product before it ever hits design. And that's even being utilized today. So there's some really cool stuff. Gamers and the educational setting are all other applications. You can be who you want to be <laughs> in a virtual world, right? But it's all about perception. Augmented reality. So augmented reality is an overlay of content on top of the real world. Uh, and that content is not anchored. It's not part of it. And the real world content and CG content are not able to respond to each other, not able to directly interact with each other. So augmented reality stuff is happening in real time, live. And you'll see some of this augmented slash mixed reality that we'll play with today with the meta too. So there's a huge need for it. Um, and you know, a great example of augmented reality is Google Glass. How many of us are familiar with Google Glass? How many of us had a chance to play with Google Glass? Here's Google Glass. So the really cool thing about Glass is your ability to see information in a HUD, in a heads-up display, to the point where there was a firefighter here in North Carolina that uploaded the entire hydrant map for his district into Glass. So when he drove the fire engine responding on a scene, guess what he had? The entire mapping system. He knew where all the hydrants were well before he arrived, and he had directions to the hydrants of what was in service and out of service. So you think about the potential for something like augmented reality or heads-up display that's impactful and powerful. We see the impact. This is a heads-up display on a C-130. Right? You can see the information that's being populated to you. You see where it is, and we see where zero is in terms of land. Um, I'll have to, I think in this next slide, I'll have to apologize for one of the folks who's a really good sport about it, but we use augmented reality today on our phones. What, what program uses augmented reality? Snapchat? 
Kevin was a really good sport. But we have fun with it. We enjoy it, right? But the potential for augmented reality is there. Think about the environments that you can create as a result of just overlays and information that you can provide individuals. So mixed reality is really an overlay of synthetic content on the real world that is anchored with and interacts with that environment. Right? So as you move, it moves. So one can argue Snapchat is really mixed reality of some sort. Because in Snapchat, when you stick your tongue out like you did on that dog, what does the dog do? His tongue gets bigger and licks, right? So the environment is, it, it sees the environment and interacts with the environment. Oftentimes you'll see virtual, the, the virtualness exists in ultrasound images on patients while performing an operation. It's a great example. So synthetic content reacts with real world con content providing you with information. The next generation, and I'll share with you um, a little bit of information about HoloLens a little bit later, but the cool thing with Holo and all the really neat products that are going on is the potential to mix virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality together. Right? So it's ultimately mixed reality. But to be able to see your CT, your ultrasound, your image in your heads-up display or in the lens, and then and as he has here with Meta 2, be able to actually still perform your surgery and do everything as you're looking at the layers and pieces. Right. So at, before you cut, you can see the layer below in your head in your in your virtual display, and you can see all of the vital organs that are present. So there's a lot of potential as we work through the technology. Mixed reality, 1994, um, it was uh, put together by Milgram and, and Kanusu, and it's really an extreme, right? So you have um, severe mediated re uh, virtual reality up top, you have augmented virtual, and then you have mediated reality on the left. Mixed reality sits somewhere in the middle. It's a really hard place to be. One could argue that it's somewhere almost impossible to get to. But the amazing technological advances we've had in the last 30 years have just completely pushed. And we're close. There are tactile things out there that will almost make you feel like you're in that environment. You're in that spatial plane. We're really close. Another five years, it'll be really scary to see that holodeck come to life. There is tons and tons of applications in mixed reality. Aviation, military training missions, proceduralists needing images while performing surgery in real time. So you have to ask the question, what's the difference between augmented reality and mixed reality, and why do I really care? Well, it's huge. Both create this enhanced, enriched environment. They're widely utilized in entertainment. And I would arguably say they're widely utilized in edutainment as well, right? education and entertainment as a single growth area. Uh, they, you're seeing this increased use in dabbling in healthcare. We're starting to broach into this virtual and augmented reality spatial area. Um, and you know, augmented reality simulates artificial objects in the real world, whereas virtual reality is an artificial environment. It's a big difference between the two. Um, headsets or hand controllers are available in augmented reality, whereas interaction with a mobile device in the real world is very much possible in a virtual uh, environment. So where do we see really the difference? The real world versus virtual world, and this is just another example of that larger diagram. We're f shooting for this middle ground between the two. That's our goal. That's where we want to be. You guys could get us there. There's enough brain power in this room to figure out a lot of this stuff and create that next level. And it was impressive to watch some of the hackathon stuff. Because right? what were we essentially creating? The next generation of simulation technology. Right? You guys are really pushing the envelope to create something really cool. So we're going to do a little bit of crowdsourcing. Figure there's about 160 people in here, roughly, right? So. We know that ideas drive change, and they impact what we do and really how we do it. And we know that ideas force us to be creative, to inquire, to innovate, to ultimately create something that is either tangible or has tangible value at the end of it. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you five minutes. In your little groups around you and the people around you, I want you to work together to create a new educational program or a potential educational program that leverages CGI, virtual reality, or augmented reality. Think about the stuff that I've shown you. What is cool that you would love to see in your environment? And we'll spend about five minutes after that shouting out ideas and how you came to that idea. Right? I'm really interested to see what you collectively come up with 
because there's some potential here that we can really change the scope of simulation-based education. So here's the questions. What can we do with CGI? What can we do with augmented reality? And what can we do with virtual reality in our areas? Any other questions? Cool. I'll start the timer. Just the people around you, just start chatting about stuff. <laughs> to be interesting to see.
Wait about 15 more seconds. It's like, uh, what's that movie? Uh, there's a TV show that has the 24. All right, time. So let's hear it. What do we got for ideas? I think up here they said they want more of them. If they had the ability to do anything, they would create more of them. Go for it. Thank you for sharing. That's pretty cool. Go for it. So I think one of the big challenges is a lot of Let me get you a mic. I think one of the big challenges that many centers face is funding and allocation of resources. So using, we've used augmented reality, um, sort of a low cost, uh, practical sense of creating some stickers we can put on as moulage. So now we're, rather than taking the time to moulage the mannequins, we're using that. So when the, when the learners come in initially, they're looking at. They have something visual and tactile. Correct, of. but not only that, I mean, you can also create a QR, or excuse me, an AR code that images your space. Like yep. My space I work in is defense, so it's a particular space. But you can set up the mannequin in front of that, have your, your phone project that to a video projector, and just sort of create your own poor man's cave. Right. So looking for practical applications, that, you know, low cost, um, Effective sims, I guess. So, if I can, I'll decipher a little bit, which is so taking a projection system like this, projecting an image or a background, and then putting a simulator in front of it. Correct, and also using combining the augmented codes to create that. If you had a company that sort of creating those things, just I think there's a business opportunity for right. people to create these tags that you can put on the mannequin with some imaging devices that rather than us spending all our time trying to create you know, this environment that maybe we're not good at, we don't have time, we don't have resources, it just cuts a lot of labor out and creates a lot more immer immersive environment. Cool, thank you. What else? Anybody else have anything cool? Sir? And in that environment, you could. Yes. In that environment, you could without remake it being every time, right? Right. Sir. Uh, we're from Orlando, so we're we got Disney in our backyard, and 
you, you watch the fireworks shows, you see the um, Disney castle crumble and, and, and change colors. It can, uh, so, I mean, the technology is already there. Can they, they can project any 3D mapping onto that. Uh-huh. All it is is scaling it down and making it cost effective enough for a smaller scale. Um, having that life like mannequin is actually capable of doing that kind of stuff. It can have the di- diaphoretic, it can have the cyanosis, it can have all that, it can talk to you, it can blink anything at once. Just got to make it cost effective. I think one of the coolest jobs out there is the Disney ones, right? Who wants to be an Imagineer when they grow up? <laughs> like, then the possibilities become endless, right? And you have an unlimited budget of sorts, so it kind of makes it even better. Right? All right. So what does the future bring forward? And I think it's important for us to look at that white room environment. So this is just an example of a holodeck in place. And there's so much other potential. When we look at the human field of view, we see this field of view where we want to create um, a larger viewing rate. We want to feel more immersive. We want to be able to be part of that environment. And to do that, we have to completely change perception. We have to be able to expand what we see and why we see it, which is why a lot of these goggles and glasses that you see out there really do go all the way around. Right? They make you feel more immersed and part of that environment. Here's the problem. One hour in a VR lens is great. Nine hours in a VR lens and you're done. You can only take so much of it before you cross a threshold, right? And there's some really cool stuff out there. The cool thing with virtual reality stuff is when you're in that spatial plane, at some point in time, guess what you're going to do? Run out of room or a cord, and you're going to hit a wall, right? So it's interesting to see technology out there where it's essentially a treadmill for virtual reality environments. So you can have that unlimited walking space available to you. So. It changes the the entire nature of how we do things. And when we think about that, we think about how how much information is really important for us to be successful. And that information is all about what we need. And I would argue to say, if you watch Short Circuit, need more input, right? The more information we have, the better environment we can create and the better experience we can provide our students. When we translate that into simulation, how realistic does it have to be in the experience? Sometimes it doesn't have to be that realistic at all. But sometimes it has to be so immersive and so, so realistic that they forget that they're outside of that, that general environment. And a great example is aviation. You ever walk into a flight simulator? Yep. Does it sound real? Does it feel real? Does it hear? Do you, you have that touch tell? It's amazingly real. And you don't realize that you're not on an airplane outside of the fact that there's an instructor's control panel in that space. Right? It's very realistic. And that's the question we have to ask ourselves is how realistic do we really need to make it? This is our world today. When you walk into a grocery store, you can take certain apps, like there's one called Keyring. You can walk in and look, and it'll tell you where stuff is. It'll tell you what's on deals, what you got coupons for. Right? If you ever shop at Walmart, you can scan your receipt, and Walmart says, ooh, you screwed up. You spent too much money. Right? This is our world today. And this is the world that we in education should force ourselves to get to. So virtual reality really does change it, because you can be what you want to be. And it doesn't have to be expensive. This is $8. You can order on Amazon. It's a cardboard cut out of a box. You stick your phone in there. There's magnifiers. And it allows you to create that virtual environment. You know what's really cool? Go watch TV on that. You feel like you're in a movie theater. Right? Because it's right there. The problem you run into even today is we don't know what the long-term impacts of using virtual environment glasses is on the human brain. They're still studying it, right? So there's a point in time where there's a threshold of how much you can take before it, you cross that level. But we're seeing these gamer pods pop up all over the place. And they're allowing you to be able to get out of the environment, have a different view, and relax or meditate. And these environments project anything from beaches and oceans and skies all the way to immersive learning and gaming environments. And there's some amazing stuff that's out there that allows you to be completely interactive. Imagine telemedicine. Imagine being able to interact with your patient, hear your patient, and the stethoscope is part of that environment. So when you touch that patient that isn't even there, the computer on the other end essentially is bringing that same device up and touching your patient's lungs. So it's as if you were at the bedside being part of that environment. These are all things that we can help facilitate doing. So Meta2 is tethered to a desktop PC. 
Uh, it runs at a 2560 by 1440 resolution, and it has about a 90 degree field of view. Um, one of the things with, with Meta 2 is that it's got a basic SDK, uh, SDK support for hand recognition. So you will see Don lift his arms up, and you're going to see his hands in the field of view to be able to interact with that spatial environment. It allows for software-based in, uh, inside-out tracking. Um, and you know the cool thing with this is that it's equivalent to HTC Vive. It's uh, this rich, immersive environment. And we're going to really play with three different objects inside of Meta 2 that you'll have a chance to see. I'm going to switch over, and uh, Don's going to actually, you're going to see Don's headset here in a second. There you go. Nope. All right, so while he works through that, uh, so the, thing, the three things that we're going to show you are a car engine. And the really neat thing with the car engine as he brings it up is going to be your ability to be able to go inside of the vehicle. I can tear apart the engine and see every part, every piece, every piece of mechanics. So think about this from a training perspective, right? Here is the engine functioning. He's able to look at it. He's able to move it out and interact with it. There's the parts. There's the pieces. If you're troubleshooting something and need help doing that, Think about the potential to do that. If I'm training a student on a particular anatomy or a piece of technology, imagine being able to get into that and allow them to interact with that space and take their educational level to the next point. Uh, the next thing he's going to show you is the heart. There's a human heart, and arguably a beating human heart at that. So what's the potential here? How many of us teach anatomy and physiology? Can you imagine what you can do with this for your students? Does it completely change how you would provide education in that virtual environment? Does it change how, in, how information we gathered? For the student to be able to see the beating heart, see it move, and be able to interact with it and see different portions of it, right? It completely changes how we teach chest pain and cardiac management in a lot of ways. So the last thing he's going to show you, which is really cool to me, is bubbles. Before we may do butterflies too, but bubbles. So this is that interacting with the virtual world and the virtual world being able to touch kind of back at you. There's all the bubbles, but you notice what he can do with them? What is he doing? Popping balloons or popping bubbles. So what do you think? What are the interactions with it? It's pretty cool, isn't it? If you want a chance to play with it, um, tomorrow in the Sim Center, we're going to have Meta out. So come on by. You'll get a chance to actually touch it and feel it and play with it, right? So tomorrow morning, come on out. But it's amazing stuff to be able to do. Do butterflies real quick. And this is a beta, I might add. We were talking about this yesterday with butterflies. Can you imagine if you could actually feel the butterflies on your hand in this? It's kind of peaceful when you think about it. <laughs> so one of the in interesting things we were talking about is he can actually still see his hand. So the butterflies are more translucent on the image than they are on the meta on the, uh, through what he's looking at on the screen. But this is a version of, of augmented reality. All, one could argue it's the starts of mixed reality in a lot of different ways. And the medical applications are enormous. Cool. Thank you. So Microsoft HoloLens is another piece of unique technology. And I want to share with you some of the stuff that they're doing. This is changing how we use healthcare today. It's changing how education interacts with our environment. It's a completely different, um, it's a mixed reality technology that we really need to, to think about how we're going to inject into education.
That's today. That is happening today. People are leveraging that technology to be able to take medicine and education to the next level. And it's something we should think about leveraging in our own areas. So another piece I want to focus on is Oculus. How many of us have heard of Oculus Rift? Pretty cool. It's still not at a point where it's consumer friendly, is it? It's still really expensive to get your hands on all of the technology. But the immersiveness that it creates is absolutely amazing. And when you create an image inside of Oculus, this is what it looks like. And you're seeing each individual view because it's the left and the right eye. But together, you feel like you're in that space, right? So another tech is Star VR. The unique thing with Star VR is your field of view. Right, so what we pointed out with Meta 2 was a 90 degree field of view. You're, all, you're at a 100 degree field of view with Star VR, so you're almost back here when you're looking at it. You feel a lot more immersive. And it's interesting to see how that plays a role. A lot of the Star VR stuff being utilized today has been utilized at uh, like NASA and other areas when they're looking at global uh, like, uh, telescopes and stuff to be able to dig deeper into layers of space. And then something really cheap is wear abilities, a wear ability, Sky. Um, it's like $79, it's not really expensive, but allows you to be able to inject your phone into this and create that environment. I think you look pretty silly though. Imagine wearing that as you're walking around. So, all right, so I'm gonna turn the lights off for a sec, and I want you to, this is through the lens of Oculus, right? This is what it looks like if you're in Oculus and looking through that lens. So I'm going to turn the lights off, and I want you to be able to picture what that looks like. So imagine only wearing Oculus and the headphones and playing that game. No. That's usually the general expression, hell no. <laughs> it is amazing to see how scary those video games are to the point where people forget that they're in, they're in a safe place because they get so immersed and lost in that environment. Right? So for us in the clinical medicine realm, Imagine being able to recreate the events after a root cause analysis. Build a scenario in an Oculus. Be part of that team. Work through the process, identify the issues, and then implement the change all in a virtual environment where you're safe. All of it is possible. It's a matter of us doing it. Give me a second. Thinking? All right. So the applications in healthcare are kind of endless, and they're designed to treat and heal PTSD, to manage pain. Uh, the virtual environments are utilized for human factors, for architectural spatial, for virtual meetings. We see it utilized for human resources, for image management, even for direct clinical 3D animations to see things in a different area. I'm going to play this quick. Uh, it's about three minutes long. This is on virtual reality and the use for PTSD.
So there's a lot of possibility of the use of technology in treating PTSD and other symptoms. And when we think about taking it to a next level, think about the ability to leverage augmented reality or mixed reality in technology that we have today. So we add, this is Premi, right? So Lerdahl's Premi baby. You add an ECMO component to it and a headset. And can you imagine what you can be able to work through in the process issues that you can find all with injecting ECMO and a Premi baby using an augmented reality space? There's so much potential and so much issues that we need to work through, but it's all possible if we just think outside the box. And there is truly a connection here. There's great value in CGI and simulation. There's great value in using augmented reality or virtual reality or mixed reality. And this can all be part of education if we're willing to invest the time and the energy and the effort. What we often forget is simulation is not only uh, uh, provider focused, it's about what about the patients, right? What about using the technology and our educational methodologies in taking care of our patients? So there's a method, there is the methodology and it's important for us to, to think about the methodology and least of the importance is the technology. The technology will help you deliver the methodology and don't forget to use that methodology. We shape the future as technologists. We drive that passion. Be simple about it. You don't have to go overly complex. There's always new tools out there. You want to stay innovative. You want to stay rele uh, relevant in what we're able to accomplish. And don't forget to integrate current technology with future stuff. Any questions? Cool. Well, thank you for the time. Thanks for Laird all for sponsoring us as well. takes off my time. I'm good with it. Here, hook me up. Uh, yeah, it wouldn't hurt. Come visit us. We have everything we talk about. Oh, yeah? Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Do you need a clicker just in case? I yeah, it wouldn't hurt. Other side. It's an air. That's $50, by the way. My phone, I tried to start using my phone and battery, it just killed the battery. This was crazy. Yeah, yeah. Like, we have a 